So let's talk about type 1 hypervisors. So when we're talking about type 1 hypervisors, we're talking about bare metal hypervisors. Again, what bare metal hypervisors mean is that you have the, the hardware, you install the hypervisor directly onto the hardware, and then you install instances of operating systems on to uh, the hypervisor. So when you're, you're looking at the, the hardware that you're going to be using type, wider, type 1 hypervisors on, you're looking at real servers. So for me, this is one of the servers that I use for type 1 hypervisor virtualization. This is a real bad, nasty little 1U Xeon bugga bugga boo um, server. So this server is something that will sit in a server rack. This is not the type of computer that is going to be sitting under your desk. If you've ever, ever heard one of these things turned on, it's deafening. It sounds like a little jet engine uh, underneath your desk. So when you're dealing with type 1 hypervisors, you're not going to generally be dealing with the types of computers that you would buy at Best Buy or uh, you know, at uh, Walmart or, Mart or such. When you're dealing with type 1 hypervisors, you're going to be dealing with real enterprise uh, servers. The reason for this, uh, we're going we're gonna to talk about it in a minute. So, with these type 1 hypervisors, again, what you're going to have is you are going to have your physical server here. So this is going to be that 1U server that I just showed you. You then, onto that physical server, you are going to install the hypervisor. So this type 1 bare metal hypervisor, think of it as a very basic operating system. So just like you would install Mac OS X, or you would install Windows 7, or you would install uh, Linux, you would install the hypervisor onto the hardware. So it's a pretty simple install process. Basically, you put in the CD, you hit next, 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 and then it gives you some information at the end. We're not going to go into this in depth and actually show you how to set this up. We will do that at a different class. Right now, I just want you to give, the, give you the concepts. Then, once you've installed the hypervisor, you can then install instances of operating systems onto the hypervisor that is on that physical hardware. So like I say, you can have Windows, 2008, Linux, Unix, etc, etc, etc. Basically, as, as long as the hardware can support it, you can continue to put instances of operating systems on there. You could have 50 instances or 100 instances. God help you, however much you, uh, you want to put on there. Now, here's one of the big things. When you start using hypervisors, it's, it's going to throw you for a loop, kind of like the first time you use Linux. If you, if you remember the first time you used, you used Linux, uh, you know, you install it, and then you get a little blinking cursor, and then you don't know what the hell to do next. That is going to be what is going to happen with you the first time you install a Type 1 bare metal hypervisor, because you're going to install that hypervisor um, onto your, your hardware, and then when it reboots, it's going to like give you its IP address, and that's about it. Basically, you're looking at the equivalent of a little Linux graphics screen that's going to give you very, 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 very little information. It's going to give you it's like its IP address, what kind of processor is on it, the RAM, and that's all it's going to have. And you're going to scratch your head. You're going to be like, what the hell? What do I do with this? Because you're just looking at a screen, and you're basically just getting a blinking cursor. Well, the reason for that is with a Type 1 hypervisor, you need something called a management console. So the management console is what actually manages the hypervisor. So you don't do very much of anything on the physical computer directly with that hypervisor. What happens is you sit at a computer like this. On the computer, you will have management software installed and then using that management software, you will then manage this hypervisor. We'll get into this more when we actually do a practical class uh, on the hypervisors. But basically what you need to understand is you're going to have a computer that will have the management software installed. Using that management software, you will connect to this hypervisor. That's why they give you the IP address of the, uh, of the computer. And then from there, you are able to install and manage these instances. So basically, I would go to the physical computer. Uh, 
So this computer, I would, I would install the hypervisor on. I would then throw this into the rack, I would connect it to the network, I would make sure that this server gets the IP address. So the hypervisor will say whatever the IP address is, right? So once this is in the rack, once it has an IP address, I will then go to my normal desktop computer that has the management software installed and then I will be able to configure the hypervisor from here. So I'll be able to install operating systems from here. I'll be able to do all the funky configurations. This is very important to understand. Like I say, when this server boots up, the screen you're going to get, again, it's going to tell you the computer has a Xeon processor, how much RAM it has, um, and a few other almost pointless things. There's very, very, very little do, you can do at the computer with the hypervisor installed. You, you, most of the time, basically all you can do is like change a password and uh, change the IP address. Uh, that's about it. So that is how you're going to be interacting uh, with the hypervisor on the server, so through the management console. Why this, this happens in this way is because since the management is controlled by the management console, you can now have this management console make things automatically happen with servers with this type of hypervisor installed. So let's say you have a rack of physical servers, those 1U servers I showed you. Let's say, I'm not going to write them out. Let's say you have 20 in that rack, right? You then have the hypervisor installed on all 20 of those computers. Well now, with the management console, you can move instances of operating systems between these physical servers, again, basically like copying and pasting. So if you have Windows 2008 server running on this hypervisor, on this server, you can simply move it to this server through the management console and it will just work. Basically, you just click, I want to move this instance from here to there and it will just auto-magically happen. You can now move the instances of the operating system that easily. With the management software, you can also get a lot of cool other features. So, um, so when you're using servers, if you've been in an enterprise environment, you know that servers need different amounts of resources throughout the day. So if you have an Active Directory server, an Active Directory server is what allows you to authenticate or log on to a Windows network. Now you need to hit that server a lot or your employees will need to hammer that server a lot. Let's say, you know, in the morning or at, after lunch is over, etc. There's going to be certain times of the day and that server is going to need a lot of resources. Um, at other times of the day, it's not going to need so many resources. Well, what this management software can do is it can automatically move instances of operating systems between physical servers based on their current resource needs. So let's say right now we have these three instances of operating systems running on this hypervisor. None of them is being used very much, so none of them need very many resources. They're all just trucking along, doing fine. Well, all of a sudden, a lot of people start logging in to the Windows 2008 server. It starts needing a lot of resources. It starts needing uh, more resources than this physical server can handle. Well, the management software will then automatically move this Windows 2008 instance to whatever server, physical server, has enough resources for it to run properly. So it can just migrate literally that easily, that automatically. Why this is important in the enterprise world is electricity bills get very high. This one little server down here can probably cost one or two hundred dollars a year uh, in electricity. It pulls a lot of electricity. So obviously if you have hundreds or thousands of servers, that can be a very big power bill. Well, if you can automatically consolidate servers or send them out to different pieces of hardware based on the, the requirements, you can have your hardware be turned off most of the time and only be turned on when it's actually used. That's one of the cool things with the management software and the new physical server hardware that's out there is this management software can actually turn these servers on and off as needed. Not simply moving the instance, but actually turn them on. So this server can be off 
the management console or the management software can decide it needs to use it. It can turn it on. It can move the instance, and, and, and that, that's how easy it goes. Also, with the management software, it can do things for fault tolerance. So let's say you have this server, uh, the instance of the server running on this hypervisor. Well, with the management software, if the physical hardware fails that's running all of this, the management software can automatically migrate these instances literally so quickly that you don't even realize that the physical hardware failed. So imagine that especially in the enterprise world. If, a server, if the hardware for a server crashes, it's no big deal. All the instances of the operating systems were automatically moved. They're all up and running. Your users never saw any downtime. They never even saw a blip. And so now you can, you, can, you can fix this hardware whenever you get around to it. That's one of the things that, that makes these Type 1 hypervisors so cool. And again, all these powerful features are probably not something you're going to be using in your house or you need to use in your house, but in the enterprise world, um, they're, they're really, really, really good. Now, when you're, you're doing this, uh, one thing to think about with, uh, when you're deciding the, um, the, the hardware and such that you're going to use is that the, some of these type 1 hypervisors allow you to do something called over allocation. So what over allocation means is if this physical server here only has let's say uh, 16 gigs of RAM, right? And you want to put multiple instances of operating systems onto that hypervisor. So you want to put Windows and Linux and Unix, right? Now what you can do is you can actually give these different instances of the operating systems more total RAM than the computer has. So you can say this Windows 2008 server can have up to 12 gigs of RAM, this Linux server can have up to 10 gigs of RAM, and this Unix server can have uh, up to 8 gigs of RAM. If you add all this up, it comes to 30 gigs of RAM. Well, there's only 16 gigs of RAM on here. What over allocation allows to happen is each one of the instances of these servers thinks they have this much RAM, but the server, the hypervisor, only gives them the RAM that they actually need. So again, remember, throughout the day, your server is going to need more or less resources. So at the high point, your Windows 2008 Active Directory server might need all 12 gigs of RAM. You know, 1% of the day, it might need all that RAM. The rest of the day, it only needs 2 gigs. Well, what can happen is when that Windows 2008 server needs the 12 gigs of RAM, the hypervisor can give it all that RAM, while your other servers don't need it. They're just sitting there. You know, one's a file server and one's a web server. They're, they're fine with, uh, you know, 2 gigs of RAM each. Well, once the time has passed where this Windows 2008 server needs all that RAM, the hypervisor can take it back, but the Windows server doesn't see it. The Windows server still thinks it has 12 gigs of RAM. But the hypervisor can take it back and give it to, let's say, the Linux server or the Unix server if it needs it. So in the morning, the Windows server needs 12 gigs of RAM, so it uses all 12 gigs of RAM, and the, uh, the Linux web server doesn't need it. Well, then, an hour later, the Windows server doesn't need as much RAM. The Linux server, let's say it's getting hammered as a website, it needs all the RAM it can get. So then the hypervisor now gives that Linux server uh, the, the RAM it needs. That is something called over allocation and if you're looking to purchase a hypervisor or use a type 1 hypervisor it is something that you should look for.